again, everyone. I actually want to start this panel with kind of the end of the last panel, the, this perception that STEM fields are, I believe the quote was, all male, all white, very boring, filled with tortured geniuses. So we have that perception, right? So I want to talk a little bit about why that perception exists and then what is being done to fix that, what's being done to counter that. Maria, I want to start with you. As somebody who covers gender issues, every time I want to talk about gender diversity in STEM, everyone brings up Harvey Mudd. Endlessly. So with good reason, right? So nationally, the share of computer science majors who are women is 16%, somewhere around there. At Harvey Mudd, it's half. It's 55%. So can you talk a little bit about what has been happening at Harvey Mudd to change that calculation and to get so many more women into computer science? Happy to talk about it. So first of all, Harvey Mudd is on a mission, in case you didn't know. <laughs> And on the back of my t-shirt says, educating the next generation of passionate problem solvers. So uh, one of the things, when I arrived at Harvey Mudd, only 10% of the computer science majors were female. And that was about, you know, the, for the last decade, the number has sort of ranged from about, uh, averaging about 11 to about 15%. Mm -hmm. And however, the computer science faculty, a year before I arrived, had decided to do something about this. So they had already started working on it. And um, the first thing they had decided to do was to change the introductory course that every student had to take. And that course was generally referred to as learning to program in Java. Now, in reality, it was not learning to program in Java. Yes, they did use the Java programming language, but it was actually learning about computational principles, the, the big ideas in computer science. And so they reframed it as team-based creative problem solving in science and engineering using computational approaches. That's where the computer science part came in, using Python. And what they were trying to do was teach the same kind of material, same rigor, same challenge, but do it in a way that was really fun and engaging and not intimidating for everyone. So among other things, if you've been in an introductory computer science course at, in college, it's very common for there to be one or two students in the class who seem to know everything. Mm -hmm. And they, they're almost always male, <laughs> often white, and they use up all the airtime asking questions, answering questions. And they completely scare, intimidate every other student in the class because they seem to know so much more. So what they did was they split it into two flavors, intro course. Our colors are gold and black. So CS5 gold was for people who had no background, and CF, CS5 black was for people who had perhaps an AP computer science class before they got there. And um, they did lots of other things to make sure that there was lots of support, so you're never sitting in your dorm room stuck with this piece of code that just won't work. Um, there's always uh, lots of other students to help out and so on. Um, they started taking large numbers of female students to the Grace Hopper Celebration of Computing. Um, they offered summer research opportunities to female students after the end of the first year. Uh, so that they could see that computer science could be used to address problems in society. And the bottom line is that within three years, we were at 40% female. And last year, we graduated our first group of CS majors that was more than 50% female. And I'll just say that um, this is happening in other areas at Harvey Mudd as well. We're roughly 50-50 in engineering and in physics, which are uh, two other areas where women tend to be underrepresented. So not dumbing it down, making it just as challenging, but providing lots of support, making it possible to see why what you're learning actually matters in the world. Works. Cynthia, I want to talk a little bit about, so we've talked about the gender issue there. I want to talk a little bit about this in an intersectional lens. So oftentimes when we talk about gender issues in the workplace and then we talk about issues of racial diversity in the workplace, they're completely separated. And it leaves this really, really <laughs> tiny pot of women of color who are kind of disadvantaged on both ends of the spectrum. So I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about the context of where women of color are when it comes to being incorporated into the STEM world and some of the efforts that are happening there. 
Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with this distinguished panel. And I just want to put that question in a little bit of context. In my work, I work as a narrative personality psychologist, and I'm a professor at Howard. And so I work with women and women of color in academic and corporate environments. And much of that work really is focused on trying to help women of color identify experiences of gendered racism. So that's a prevalent experience. Um, um, sexism exists, and then when you enter racism, it adds a layer of complexity to the daily lived experience that creates certain kinds of stressors. Um, gendered racism also has the impact on women of color in terms of them um, being left out certain elements of team science and high stake projects. And so what we try to do um, in our work, for example, in the Society for Women of Color in STEM, is we really try to create opportunities to empower them to really shore up their mindset or psychology of success to traverse these fields that still are very isolated. Um, that still don't always recognize the talents that um, women of color bring. And so one strategy is empowerment of women of color in STEM. And another strategy really is to put some pressure, um, if you will, on individuals who are administrative leaders in academic environments and corporate environments to really be responsible for trying to develop a culture and a climate and policies that really um, focus not just on diversity, but on inclusion and kind of try to help women of color step out of the role of having to be responsible for taking on that challenge. Because that really does um, create a situation where they d can't focus as much on the science or on the engineering. Manuel, you started out as a developer, you moved to teaching, and then you created Bootstrap. I want you to talk to us a little bit about that path and then explain what Bootstrap is and why you made it. Sure. Uh, so, so I had this sort of like life plan. I, w I was that kid who loved teaching and loved computer science. And I went to school to study both, and I had this idea that I would uh, go to Silicon Valley and sort of make my millions and then pursue my passion for teaching. <laughs> and you know, I got to Silicon Valley and I found, as a lot of us know, that the culture is not exactly the most inclusive culture. It was kind of toxic. And so I made the difficult decision to skip over the millions part and, <laughs> and, uh, and to go into teaching. Um, and so my first, my first job was as a, uh, a high school algebra teacher at a public school in Boston. And I was looking at ways we could use computer science to, to teach math. And that's what sort of led me on this path to work with an amazing team um, to build, develop Bootstrap. So uh, what is Bootstrap? So Bootstrap, at Bootstrap, we believe that every single child deserves to have a rigorous introduction to computer science. And like, we're not alone. Lots of people here are like nodding, and we should, because that's great. <laughs> um, but I think, I think when we look at what it takes to actually get there, mm -hmm. we often run into some pragmatic trouble. So one option is, well, let's just have a mandatory CS class that every child takes. OK, great. Now we have to recruit, train, and retain 100,000 full-time new computer science teachers nationally. I don't think we've got the money in the budget for that or the, the political will to add the money to that budget. And even if we did, there's a finite number of hours in the school day and rooms in the school building. So like, where are we going to put those classes? So like, forget that. Uh, <laughs> strategy two, um, opt-in classes, after-school programs, summer programs, electives. The problem is that opt-in computer science well, it competes with opt-in everything else, opt-in sports, opt-in art, opt-in theater, opt-in having a job, opt-in taking care of your little brother and sister. So that whenever you have opt-in CS, the only kids who sign up are the ones with the means and inclination. So there goes equity, there goes all. So there is a third option. And the third option is, what if we taught computer science through the existing classes that every child already takes? And, and to your point, that this also contextualizes them. We're solving problems. We're not just learning some dumb tool. So what does Bootstrap do? So it turns out that you can't just like have kids do some coding in a math class, click your heels three times, shout computational thinking, and have <laughs> success. Infusing computer science into a class like math or physics or history, for example, takes an enormous amount of respect for the discipline that's already in the classroom, for the content that's already there. And so 
We're an evidence-based group. We uh, create curricula for mainstream teachers who are already in the schools, even if they don't have a computer science background. And we have four courses in data science, physics, uh, algebra, and then, of course, a straight computer science class. And at the end of the day, the, the result is we're now one of the largest providers of in-school computer science education in the United States. We reach more than 25,000 students each year, uh, taught almost exclusively by teachers with no computer science background. And when you work with the, the teachers that reach every child, nearly 45% of our students are girls and young women. Nearly 50% of our students are students of color. Um, and so we think that this is a strategy that's been proven effective, and, uh, and we're continuing to, to look at ways we can do better. So Emmanuel just talked about some of the choke points that maybe can be solved at the you know, elementary, middle school level. Um, I'm wondering, you guys both work at the university level. That's where we think about losing a lot of women kind of as we go up the scale, as somebody said before, of majors and then graduation, finding jobs. What are the things that you think that companies and universities need to be working on to get more women through these choke points so that when we look at the field in general, it's more diverse? I think a really important one is early internships. So by early internships, what I mean is uh, companies offering internships to students who have just finished their first year in college or even before they have started college because the single thing we know that really works both for women and for people of color is if you can actually see how something you've learned makes a difference in the world, you're more li likely to stay in that major and you're more likely to graduate. And just in the last, I would say, eight years, Intel, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, most of the tech companies have started early internship programs. And, you know, that's great for a place like Harvey Mudd because they all come and recruit our students. And one of the reasons they come and recruit our students is because we're half female and we're 20 percent Hispanic and we're about 10 percent black at this point. Um, those are huge changes since 10 years ago. But what we really need is we need companies throughout the country that are recruiting at every university, every state university, uh, every small liberal arts college, et cetera, because it's easy for our students to get those opportunities, but we need it to be there for every yeah. university. Um, from the more psychological perspective, I think that it's important for universities and companies to really focus on thinking about how we change the culture of work to promote healthy living and self-care not just for women, but women in particular, because what I'm finding with students that I work with at Howard and around the country is that women want to be in work environments that support their whole self. And we know because of the nature of work that um, there is a lot of stress. Um, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of women in the United States. And so we see some traction in some companies where they really are promoting a healthy workplace as part of what it is that they do to recruit men and women. And so I think we need a lot more attention um, on how we can help young women um, develop careers where they are excelling in science and engineering, advancing in their careers, but also have the capacity to really take care of um, themselves. And I think that that's something that um, we see. We've talked about sleep in the country, and um, CDC has said that that's a national epidemic. And in science and engineering, it's a culture in which it's 24-7 work. And it's really having an impact. And young women are beginning to question more and more, can I have a career in science and engineering? Can I have a family? And can I be well? I have another question or two for our panel. But again, I will be coming to the audience in a few minutes for questions. So think about them, condense them. Uh, <laughs> Manuel, I want to talk a little bit. I want to go back to something that was said in an earlier panel, where it, the question was raised, maybe part of the problem is that American culture has done such a good job of making interest in computer science and math and things like this so uncool. I'm wondering, <laughs> I'm wondering if your approach of kind of putting these lessons about computer science and about math, about all of these things that can help you get on this path, 
into things that they're already learning and not separating it out. I'm wondering, do you think that's a way that we could maybe help change the narrative on that? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, you want me to say more? Yeah. No, <laughs> um, no I mean, I mean, look, like I think, I think that there's there needs to be a balanced approach, right? And so you need opt-in programs that are absolutely, hey, computer science for girls, engineering for women of color, right? Like we need these things, but it can't just be those things. Because if all we have is just those things, then, oh, you're that girl who went into the computer club. You're that kind of girl, right? We're on the, if we do those in isolation, we unintentionally deepen those grooves and reinforce those narratives yeah. that, you know, it's just that kind of person who does that. And maybe they're not a white boy, but they're still that kind. So the way you break that is you have a balanced approach. You have those programs, but you also say, you know what? You know, no one thinks that reading is for white dudes because you read in every class. You have to know how to do that. <laughs> and so like if all of us, if all of us who went through middle and high school looked around and we realized that we were all programming in all of our classes and we were using computer science, it becomes something that is just a non-issue. It's just, oh, of course you know some computer science. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, so one of the things that's really interesting for me is um, when we changed our intro to yes class. Um, so MUD is one of the five undergraduate Claremont colleges, Pomona, Scripps, CMC, Claremont, McKenna, and Pitzer are, are the others. And um, not, the colleges are side by side, so the students can and do take courses at the other colleges, but virtually no students from the other colleges took courses at MUD, because MUD courses were supposed to be harder and we don't give a lot of A's and, you know, a lot of work, all that kind of stuff. And then we created this computer science course, which was, it's mandatory for our students. And within the last five years, it's now true that 60% of the students taking that class are from the other colleges. And I have students from Scripps and Pitzer and so on come up to me on the campus and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. I had no idea that computer science could be so much fun. And now I've got a summer internship, and I've got this, and I've got that. And so it has gone from being something, that's something that those MUD students do, to, oh my god, CS5 gold, this is the funnest thing. So you know, just, I, I think what was amazing to me was the fact that they did it for women made it so popular to the students from the other colleges who don't see themselves as math and science geeks for the most part. And so you know, my feeling is if you get it right, it absolutely everyone will love it. Can I add something mm -hmm. here? I think it's important to shift the conversation a little bit and share a little bit about Howard University um, because I work in an environment with brilliant, black women from all over the country and other countries throughout the world in science and engineering. And so my experience is one in which I see brilliance every day. And the questions that we ask at Howard, we don't ask questions like why do black women not participate in STEM, we ask questions like, why do they? What can we do to support them? And Howard University actually is a pioneer in diversity. In 1867, we were founded. Our founders admitted four white women as our students as the in a time when in history, people weren't admitting women to college, and then our founders also developed a medical school. So if you think about it for a moment and what kind of narrative exists institutionally to believe that former slaves and women can do science, we started there. And so it's no wonder that in 2017 at Howard, we're very successful, top in the country, in producing African-American women and men in STEM who go on to earn PhDs and in industry. So I think we have something to learn about diversity and inclusion and a psychology of success from Howard University and other HBCUs, because there's something we got right, and also our faculty is very diverse. So it's not just that we have black professors that make something happen there. So I think we can learn a lot from Howard and our HBCUs. I want to make sure we have time for audience questions. So if you have a question, do put your hand up high. Can 
Hi, my name is Shalina Chalani. I'm the Associate Editor for Education Dive. Um, President Claw, this is a question more for you. Um, I think that there's a clear moral argument for increasing access to the field for women and underrepresented minorities, but what is the actual business case argument for presidents of higher education institutions to start focusing on STEM fields and getting more people into these fields? So, so uh, I think there's a clear business case for everyone, presidents as well as industry. Um, so if we think about computer science, this country graduates about half the number that we actually uh, need and, and so if most people of color and most women are not choosing to major in computer science, this country is simply not going to have the workforce that it needs because it's not just the tech companies that are hiring. In fact, it's not just the tech companies who are actually the tech companies. These days, whether it's sports or entertainment, media, uh, healthcare, I mean, just every single retail, they all want to hire data scientists and computer scientists. And so... You know, the business case really is that if this country is going to succeed, it's a very competitive global economy right now, if we're going to succeed, we have to do better at supporting women and people of color in learning computer science, engineering, math. Because that's, I mean, it just doesn't matter what career you think you're going to have, you're going to need some of those skills. So from my perspective, the business case is if I offer programs, courses that really enable our, not just our young people, but also our middle-aged people who need to relearn some skills so they're going to be able to have a job 10 years from now. If, if I offer those opportunities, I'm going to have students beating down my doors. And, you know, Harvey Mudd is a very expensive college. That's because what we do is very high touch. We, about 75% of our students have some financial aid, but it's, it is probably the most expensive college in the country right now. And yet the demand just keeps on going up because people need this knowledge and this kind of skill. Right. And another question right here. Hi, I'm Keisha Ash from the National Science Foundation AAAS Fellow. Uh, Manuel, I love your work. We're actually highlighting it later on today at the <laughs> DC STEM Summit. Um, but the question that I have actually is coming off of one of your comments about the un unintentional reinforcement of stereotypes. And so um, I would love all of you, and I, by the way, I work on broadening participation in computing at um, NSF. And so I would love for all of you to really address what I see as a bubbling uh, conflict that says, you know, if you're a woman, you're a person of color, you have access to these specific opportunities versus, you know, this other side that has been in power, how do we actually bridge those divides so that there's more of a, um, this increase of diversity in computing is not seen as a, as a threat? Mm -hmm. Daniel, did you I'm going to take that on for a second. <laughs> um, so the first thing is, there's more than enough jobs for everyone. So the fact that we attract more women and more people of color, that's great. And just in, in terms of there are so many opportunities and just not enough people to fill them. The second thing I'll say, which is a little bit less Pollyanna-ish, is you know, when you look at culture, whether it's in large tech companies or smaller tech companies, they have a certain kind of attitude that is often quite competitive and adversarial in, in a way that many women and people of color just are not comfortable with. Like, so for example, you know, you make a statement and somebody starts screaming at you, are you trying to destroy this effing company? And the word wasn't used wasn't effing. And you know, like that's just not what I would expect to happen in a professional workplace, but it's not unusual in many tech companies. So I think we have to sort of work on two pieces to this. One piece is making sure that the way we teach people embraces everyone. But the other part is we have to work within our workplace at changing culture. 
we have to work on inclusion. There's just no question that there's, we have a long way to go. So I think those are the two pieces you have to bring together. You have to open the doors and encourage everyone to come through them, but you have to change what's happening on the other side of the door too. Mm -hmm. Did you, I, let's go right down I'm the sorry. line. Yeah. I just wanted to add to that. I agree. I, I wanted to add that I think we have to do a better job of making a case for the importance of diversity and inclusion beyond that it increases discovery and innovation um, beyond the moral argument to a personal one. I think people need to understand that what diversity and inclusion bring are, in, it's an increased in cross-cultural knowledge, it deepens identity and personal values, and that is a form of personal growth and professional development. So I think we really have to enter that kind of thinking in our discourse ar around why diversity and inclusion matters. And I'll, I'll just say two quick things. One is there's a ton of research out there about how the best way to break down those negative stereotypes and to, and to get rid of this notion of inclusion being threatening to, to those in charge is to have shared experiences at, a, at an early age. So if the computer science classes all look a certain way, regardless of that way, if you have an all white male computer science class or an all Latina computer science class, both of those have their individual merits, but the problem is there's, it becomes threatening because by definition, if we're on each other's teams, that's a little scary. So this is again sort of an argument to, towards integrating into mainstream classes, and that's sort of why Bootstrap does what it does. But the second thing I'll leave you with is that often inert knowledge becomes the gatekeeper, right? So it's like, oh, we all grew up sailing, so like you know how to sail, and I'll tell a joke about making a cross hitch or some knot. I don't sail, um, and so so inert knowledge becomes the gatekeeper that keeps people out. And when someone doesn't know it, they're threatening. Oh, you don't know how to sail? What are you doing here? And inert knowledge is a huge problem in the way we teach computer science, both in K-12 and at the university level. And what I mean by that is we often focus on the tool. If, a math, if you met a math teacher at a party and said, what do you teach? You might expect the teacher to say, oh, I teach algebra, I teach geometry. You'd, go, you would, you'd think they were nuts if they said, I teach calculator. If you met a chemistry teacher and they said, I teach Bunsen burner, you would think they were nuts. <laughs> And yet so often when you meet a computer science teacher, even at the university level, oh, I teach Python. I teach Scratch. In no other discipline would we allow that. But that's considered commonplace now. And if all you do is teach a tool, then that's all kids think that they need to learn. And that's why it becomes inert knowledge. If someone walks in and says, oh, I don't, I don't know C++, who cares? Do they know computer science? And so changing what computer science is needs to be a, less about inert knowledge and more about the concepts, like, like we're talking about here, and it needs to happen for everyone in the same place. Thank you guys so much. Everyone join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you, Maria, Cynthia, Emmanuel, and Jillian for that uh, inspired ending. It was a kind of call to action, I would say. And thank you to all our speakers and moderators for today's conversation. Um, I rarely just say this, but I loved this morning, and I hope you all did too. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that this is an especially ripe moment for this conversation. We all think about these issues all the time, but the ability to crack things wide open uh, in a raw and honest and, I hope, unpollyanna-ish way um, was galvanizing, and it was a joy to meet so many of the hidden figures we met this morning. Uh, there's a lot that stands out uh, from what we just heard, not the least of which is thinking about what it takes to manhandle a 3,400-pound machine in a long-sleeve fire-resistant suit in 130-degree heat against massive G-forces. And perhaps that's a metaphor for the drive that it still takes for women uh, to advance in this world still. Um, there's so much that I could have uh, selected from what we heard, but I will leave you with these two things, the words of two women we heard today. Uh, NIH's Maria Frere said this, understand your worth and understand how to wield your power in an astute and thoughtful way. And Harvard geneticist Pardis Sabeti said, if we want to make the world for our daughters and for future generations the way we want it to be, you stick with it. So 
Thank you all for being here. Thank you for sticking with us. You've been such a wonderful audience. We know how precious your time is, and we're really grateful that you spent so much of it with us. Um, thank you again to L'Oreal USA for making today possible. We're enormously grateful for that. Um, I have two uh, final notes before you walk out the door. Um, you have an opportunity to, to connect with Margot Lee Shetterly and Liza Mundy, the two authors you saw here on the stage earlier. They've got their books with them. and. Uh, in a, in a couple of minutes, they'll be right outside ready to sign uh, at the cafe tables out front. And last but not least, um, a, a final request from me, which is that um, on your chairs and in your emails, you will get a very, very short survey um, asking about your here, experience here today. Um, your opinion and what happened today and what you thought about it matters a lot to us. It actually shapes uh, everything we do, so we pay a lot of attention to you. Thank you so much for your time. Have a wonderful rest of the day.